Well, I can record it, and then I can post it. So we'll, we'll do it that way. OK? Yeah, I'm going to do it this way. People can't watch it live, but I'll, I'm, it's recording me now. So I'm sorry. They won't be able to watch it now. So right. It's just not working. Uh, yeah, three or four watch it live, and then other people um, watch it. Um, right. Um, just uh, in case anybody goes to, nobody is watching it right now. So. Oh, you can see that. I can. It tells me who's watching. Um, here we go. Okay, so um, you're the test crowd, <laughs> and then there'll be other people who might watch the recording. So I have um, a few things to talk about tonight, and hopefully we'll uh, open it up for discussion, questions, and whatnot. And um, uh, yeah, so Barry Palisar is just sent an email, and uh, and uh, let me just um, right. Um, okay, and. Okay, so um, I'll hopefully I can edit this uh, this recording as well, so people don't have to watch me uh, mumble and uh, play, uh, answer an email and whatnot. So um, apologies for that. Okay, so uh, I hope everybody had a good summer and a relaxing summer, and we're back uh, for the programming calendar. And um, so I I wanted to do uh, at least class tonight. Uh, if not next week as well, on the topic of preparing for the high holidays. And though I've taught this before, preparing for the holidays is a little bit different every year because we're a little bit different every year. So, and how we prepare for it, what, what the issues are in our life that impact the way we prepare for the holidays, whether it is from something as simple as who we're going to have meals with over the holidays to something more serious as to what events occurred in our own personal life that impacts our ability to celebrate and really observe the holiday appropriately. So uh, in order to prepare for the high holidays, I think first we have to understand what the high holidays are. And though uh, I might be preaching to the choir, so to speak, for those who are attending here live in the chapel, it's still good to know and be reminded of what these high holidays are, why they're called the high holidays, and um, what the history of the holiday is, holidays are before we get into how to prepare for them. In order to prepare for the holiday, you have to know what you're preparing for. So the, they're called the High Holidays because I think that that is an old English translation of what the, the holidays are called in Hebrew. They are called Yamim Noraim. So Nora can be translated, again, if we do it in Old English, could be awful. Okay, so it's not awful as in terrible, disgusting, but awful in terms of awesome, awe-inspiring. So yamim noraim are the awesome days, the days that fill us with awe, trepidation. Uh, it's like the term for the ultra-Orthodox in Hebrew are the haredim, which literally means the tremblers, the people who take um, spirituality so seriously that every little thing about Judaism and Jewish tradition and commandments and observance, all of it is taken so seriously because it's, an, it's a way to get close to God. 
And we don't want to take that, we, meaning the Haredim, don't want to take that lightly. So they tremble at the opportunity to observe a commandment, to utter a prayer, to, um, to be Jewish. So Yamim Noraim ha- has that sense about it, a sense that these days are so awe-inspiring, but awe in that it's fear, fear-inducing that our lives depend on it. That is the sense of what Yamim Noraim means. So these days, though, it's a rabbinic, um, it's a rabbinic institution. In other words, holidays that we observe today, most of them are based on the Torah. Okay, so we read in um, the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers about all the holidays that we're supposed to observe throughout the year. We read about Shabbat from Genesis and then in the other books as well. So I'm not talking about Shabbat, I'm talking about holidays. So holidays in the Torah are Passover, well, Rosh Chodesh first, once a month, the new moon uh, is a time to offer a, a special sacrifice to uh, celebrate the transition, the moon waning and then disappearing, disappearing in air quotes because you know the ancients didn't know if the moon was going to come back, but we know that it will um, until 10 billion years from now or something like that when the whole universe explodes, but we won't be around for that, so it doesn't matter. So uh, the uh, Rosh Chodesh, the new month, is a time to bring a sacrifice. Then, um, so I'm just listing from numbers in order. So we have uh, Rosh Chodesh, we have Shabbat, then we have Passover, uh, Shavuot, and the first day of the seventh month, which is celebrated how? Do we know what the Torah says? Sounding of the shofar. Why would we sound the shofar on the first day of the seventh month? Uh, No, it's not a new year. It's not a new year yet. The Torah doesn't call it the new year. Why is the seventh month so important? What day of the week is Shabbat? The The seventh day of the week. So, Seven is an important number, significant number in the Torah, it, because Shabbat is the seventh day. The sabbatical year is what number year in the cycle of years? Seven. The seventh year. And, and the, uh, what is the jubilee year? The, no, 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 uh-huh, it's a trick question. The 50th year, which happens after the seventh sabbatical year in a row. So seven times seven is 49, plus one is 50. So you have a sabbatical year in the 49th year, and then a jubilee year in the 50th year, okay? So seven is an important number because it represents this, this biblical sense of completeness. The week, it was complete after seven days. You start a new week, that's the eighth day, which may be a way to explain why a bris happens on the eighth day. There is no explanation given in the Torah. God says bris happens on the eighth day. But homiletically, if we want to try to make sense of it, why the eighth day? It's the first day after the baby has lived a full week, a full and a complete. And what is the age of which is considered we've lived a full life? Seventy. Ten times seven. Okay, so... So here we see many examples of seven being a significant number. So the first day of the seventh month then is a time of celebration, a time at Yom Truah, a day of the shofar blast. Then Yom Kippur, that is from the Torah, the tenth day of the month of the seventh month. And then Sukkot, the fifteenth day of the seventh month. And then Shmini Atzeret which also outside of Israel, the next day would be Simchat Torah. Those are all the holidays. No Rosh Hashanah. What is the new year in the Torah? The first of Nisan is, is the 
New Year because in the Torah, it's more connected to agricultural and, and seasons. So for the Torah, spring is the new year because it's new growth happening. Things are, things are sprouting out of the ground, growing from the trees. It's green, blossoms, etc. So for biblically, which is agriculturally, new year is Passover or Nisan. The rabbis debated then what should be the new year. Is, is um, Nisan, the month of Passover, the, the, new, the new month, the beginning of the year? Or is it Tishrei, which is the seventh month? See, in rabbinic times, the calendar switches a little bit in its emphasis from the agricultural nature of the holidays to a spiritual and historical nature of the holidays. Okay, so in the Torah, agriculture and the reason to observe the holidays are given. And then his history and the, and the reason and the historical reason for holidays are given. So for Passover, the historical significance of the holiday is, is the exodus from Egypt. The agricultural reason for observing Passover is springtime, the first fruits, the, some of the first harvest, the first barley harvest, the first wheat harvest happens. Shavuot, the agricultural significance of Shavuot is first fruits, okay? And then the historical reason of Shavuot, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. So, uh, Sukkot, the agricultural reason for a holiday? Harvest. A fall harvest. It's the fall harvest festival. And the, and the historical reason for the holiday? Uh, right. We, uh, we live in booths. We build a sukkah, a booth, on Sukkot to remember how, we, how our ancestors lived in temporary dwellings for the 40 years of wandering in the desert. Okay, so the three major pilgrimage holidays have both a historical and agricultural significance. There is no New Year holiday mentioned in the Torah at all. So for the rabbis, try to, they, they figure that they, we need a New Year celebration, a New Year observance. So the rabbis create from just a very tangential mention in the Torah of the first day of the seventh month being a day of the shofar blast, then expand upon that to become these yamim noraim. So, and we have Yom Kippur in the Torah as well. Leviticus chapter 18 is a full description of exactly what happens in, uh, in the temple, first the Mishkan and later the temple by the Kohanim, on this 10th day, the two goats that are offered, one led into the wilderness as the scapegoat, one offered as the sacrifice to um, uh, relieve the people of their sins, okay? And the whole description of how the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, is supposed to prepare. So from that description of Yom Kippur, which is the 10th day of the month of Tishrei, the rabbis and the first day of the month, nine days before being the day of the shofar blast, the rabbis create a very spiritual new idea of what how we are supposed to observe the new year. Other cultures have, pagan cultures, have um, different ways of, the, of observing the new year, perhaps child sacrifice or some form of human sacrifice or some other kind of offerings that are given to the agricultural gods to ensure that the new year will be one of bounty and fertility, etc. The rabbis uh, create something completely different um, for this idea of what the new year should be. Okay, so, so it's, it's, it's because of the rabbis that we observe Rosh Hashanah on the first day of Tishrei, and, um, and because of the Torah, we observe Yom Kippur 10 days later, and they create the 10 days, these 10 days of repentance, based on this idea. Another thing is, we don't know when the world was created. 
And uh, that is, uh, that's a debate among the rabbis as well, which led to when, when was the world created? Was the world created in Nisan or was the world created in Tishrei? The majority opinion was that the world was created in Tishrei and that Rosh Hashanah celebrates the creation of the world. So there's a phrase that repeats on Rosh Hashanah every time we blow the shofar in the Musaf service, in the Musaf Amida. There are three, three sections of the Musaf Amida, which I'll get to a little bit later about how to prepare for the holidays. The, uh, every time we blow the shofar, uh, right after that set of 10, we say Hayom Harat Olam. The, today the world was conceived. Or maybe the Machzor says, says today the world was born. Okay, so, and we have that, and then the song, Arashat Tzafatein, Arashat Tzafatein, okay, so that's right, those two sections are recited right after we blow the shofar in each section of the Musaf Amida, that reflects this idea that today the world was born. Okay, so the, the rabbis, so that, that's, that's the historical creation by the rabbis of this season. Now, the rabbis say that the idea of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is that they are days of judgment. So for the rabbis, how, how we prepare for the new year is the understanding that we enter the new year in, with as clean a slate as possible, that we want to be as pure and free of sin as possible, and it's an opportunity for us to reflect upon our actions and to ask God for forgiveness. Now, these concepts are not known from the Torah. We have Moses asking God for forgiveness for the people's actions with the golden calf and other incidents during the wandering of the desert, but there's no uh, commandment that you have to pray for forgiveness or, or, or pray for repentance. The prayer itself as a communal activity is a rabbinic creation to be a substitute for the sacrifices in a temple. No, can't bring a sacrifice to the temple if the Romans destroy it. The way that Judaism survives the centuries until today is that the rabbis created this substitute for prayer, for sacrifice namely prayer, and created a system that is portable, that can survive the destruction of the temple. And so part of this system is a way for on Rosh Hashanah to connect to the spiritual side of ourselves, to understand that all of our actions are uh, watched and observed by God, and it's our obligation to do as much as possible to ensure that God loves us and that God will bless us in some way. Um, and we do that through a very intense period of asking God for forgiveness and repentance. These days, as I said, are known as days of judgment. We, the rabbis, imagine God sitting on a throne with a book of judgment in front of God. Okay, now, I was in Italy this summer, went to the Vatican, had a Jewish walking tour of the Vatican. I recommend that highly. You can Google it if you ever plan to go to Rome. Please, I highly encourage you to take a Jewish walking tour of the Vatican. So, one of the main things to see in the Vatican is Michelangelo's ceiling, and front wall painting of the Sistine Chapel. So there on the Sistine Chapel, the front wall is the last judgment. So in, in Christianity, God, of course, is Jesus. So Jesus is, is right there in the middle of the wall, deciding who, and pointing down for some people and pointing up for some other people, right? So. That's the Christian idea of what happens at the last judgment. Isn't Jesus God's son? Okay, isn't Jesus God's son? Well, this isn't a class about Christianity no, and Christian development, but uh, Christians see Jesus as the embodiment of God, it's God's son, 
So if you're going to picture God, if you're Catholic, you will have a cross with Jesus, with Jesus on the cross. If you're Protestant, you'll just have the cross. And you will picture Jesus as God uh, up in heaven, and the final judgment is, like I said, pointing down for some people and pointing up for other people. So the Jewish conception of this is that God is God, the abstract God, is sitting on a throne. So that's the that's the um, the dilemma with Judaism that God is abstract. We're not supposed to picture God as having human form, but it's hard for us as human beings with limited brain capacity to be able to connect to an abstract idea. Some mathematicians and physicists can do this, can think in the abstract about what the universe looks like and think about mathematical formulas that just, uh, I am not a mathematician or a physicist for that reason, because my brain just doesn't work that way. But some people, can, their brain can work in that abstract way. They are few and far between. Maybe a couple thousand of people in the world are in this theoretical mathematics and physics world that can think uh, in that way, but most people cannot. So we need to have... Um, uh, we need to as as ascribe human emotion and form to God, but at the same time understanding that God does not have it. But it's a way for us to connect. So God seemingly is sitting on a throne with a book of with a book in front of God, which is the book of life. God determining who will be written in the book of life for the coming year. So that's why these days are called the days of judgment. Uh, Yom Kippur is called Yom Hadin. Rosh Hashanah sometimes is called Yom Hadin, the day of judgment, because we have these 10 days in which to focus on these prayers and focus on ourselves to influence God in some way to have us written into the book of life for the coming year. Okay, so uh, the month of Elul, which we are in now, the month that precedes Rosh Hashanah, the last month of the year, is this preparatory time. So if we were Sephardic, we would be getting uh, from the first day of Elul, which was this past Sunday, from the first day of Elul until the day before Rosh Hashanah, we would be getting up early in the morning every morning to recite prayers of forgiveness known as slichot. In modern Hebrew, you say slicha when you bump into someone by accident. Excuse me. That's what slicha means in modern Hebrew. But uh, lisloach means to forgive. Okay? So we're ask, we have prayers of slichot asking God for forgiveness. We know slichot as the Saturday night before Rosh Hashanah, when we, uh, in the middle of the night, we, are suppo we have this extended service in which we um, have uh, prayers and religious hymns which are, ask God for forgiveness. So in the Ashkenazi world, the, uh, these prayers of Slichot begin the Saturday night before Rosh Hashanah. So of course there's a formula for this. If Rosh Hashanah is before Wednesday, then it's the it's not the Saturday night immediately before Rosh Hashanah. You move it back a week, like this year. So Saturday night, September 24th, is Slichot. And Rosh Hashanah isn't until the, uh, a week after September 25th, which is October 1st or 2nd. Sunday night, October 2nd, right? So if Rosh Hashanah was on a Wednesday night or later, then it's the immediately preceding Saturday night. Sephardim do slichot a whole month before, and they do it every single morning in the morning service. Uh, they have a pre-dawn service. Ashkenazim only do this slichot uh, from after that Saturday night slichot until Rosh Hashanah. But they would do it pre-dawn every morning. The, the Haredim and, and very Orthodox will do that. So we don't do that here. Uh, I don't know of 
really any conservative synagogue offhand that does uh, slichot in that way, but everybody does slichot on Saturday night. Uh, now, we used to do it at midnight. When I first became the rabbi of Sharet Tefillah, we would do it at 11 or 11.30. Now it's more common to move it back to 10 or 10.30 because really it's getting harder to get people to come out for an 11.30, 12 o'clock service. But in the Orthodox world, the middle of the night service is literally the middle of the night, taking how many nighttime hours there are that particular night, dividing that amount of time in half, determining when slichot should be recited. So it could be 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning is when slichot is recited on that Saturday night. Um, so during the month of Elul then, there are, you can go online uh, to, to get readings for the month of Elul to help get us in the mood. So, so the, 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 there is an intensity uh, that increases as we move up towards Rosh Hashanah to get us in the mood. So first thing is Rosh Chodesh Elul, the idea of Slichot. Also, in the morning service, we blow the shofar. Uh, four blasts, Tekiah, the single blast, Shivarim, the three blasts, Teruah, the nine, nine short, fast blasts, and then Tekiah Gedolah, the longer single blast, excuse me. So that's done at the end of the morning service. And a psalm is added to the end of the morning service as well, Psalm 27, which our prayer book calls the psalm for the season of repentance. It can be the psalm, the psalm for the high holidays. It's this idea that uh, we want to get close to God and we want to, uh, we recognize that, um, that, uh, that God is watching us and that we want to, we have this desire to hope for God, that God will listen to our prayers. Kaveh el Adonai chazak v'yameitz libecha v'kaveh el Adonai. Hope in God, he will strengthen and add courage to your hands. Uh, have hope in God. That's the last line of the psalm. Um, and so that, the, the shofar and the psalm, the shofar is the morning service, the psalm is the morning and the evening service. That begins the process of getting us in the mood to prepare for the high holidays. So now that we know what the high holidays are, that yamim noraim, these uh, awesome days or terrible days, uh, and the history of of these days. A any questions before we before we move on? I don't, yeah. I, yeah. I don't like the use of the word terrible. I mean, right. Awful is A W E F U L. -E. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, you know, I don't think that's the right. So I'm just saying in old English, that's what it is. If you read uh, old English, terrible, terrible doesn't have the meaning that it has today. Terrible can be this awe-inspiring kind of word. So if you were to look at an older prayer book with an older English translation, you'd see words like awful and terrible, and, you, and we'd be wondering, what are these words doing here? What does that mean? What, what does that, how does that connect to God and, and our feelings? Because that's not the modern way of understanding these words. So I mean, that's why I'm just saying that Nora, uh, Nora in modern Hebrew has that double connotation. You can say Nora as it was just an awful day. How's your day? How are you feeling today? Nora ma'od. It was just an awful day. Or you can, it could can mean yamim noraim. So for a modern Israeli who doesn't go to shul and is not raised with raised with Jewish values, if he or she hears that these days are called the Yamim Naraim, they, they'd be thinking the terrible days, which meaning the, the no good days, as opposed to meaning Nora, meaning full of awe days. Okay, so that's, that's what Yamim Naraim is supposed to be. In other words, we're supposed to fear God, uh, year at Adonai, the fear of God. But are we really supposed to be in fear or recognize that um, in awe? So I prefer to translate that word as in awe of God, which no matter how we understand the word awe today or awesome, 
it still reflects uh, more positively on what what the intention of that word is. Okay. So one yes, go ahead. So the rabbis were in the, about 200 CE? The rabbis, so, the, so this, this period of time where we're talking about this whole re, recreation of, what, of Judaism is from 100 BCE to through 200 CE. Okay, and then it's the Talmud for the next 300 years. So, but basically in that 300 year time frame. And so they decided that they were in about the year 3500? They were, or, or, yeah, we're about the year 3500. Oh, yeah, so how they come up, so Julian's asking about the calendar, how, how we came up with the calendar. So, yeah, so the rabbis kind of figured out what year in the calendar we should be. Yeah, there's a whole, there's a rabbinic history book called Seder Olam. And so it's rabbinic history book as opposed to actual history, you know. So when we talk about history, historians today, that it's a very scientific method of analysis and research. Rabbis were not like that, but they researched the Torah to try to get clues as to how far ago, how long ago these events happened. So it's the rabbis who created the calendar so that now we're in year 50, we're about to start the year 5777. So uh, I tell you that... Uh, I was at an APAC rabbinic symposium today in DC. I got my 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 blue APAC pen. They also had red APAC pens. Won't say anything more about that because I can't put politics no. to affect our 501c3. But I have a blue pen and not a red pen. And you're wearing blue. That has nothing to do with it. Okay. But I'm saying there was a bowl, two bowls of pens to take. There's a red, bowl of red pens and a bowl of blue pens. Really? That's all. So, so, so APAC is bipartisan. And I, <laughs> the equal amount of pens no, in the bowl. The end, oh, I don't know. I, this was the middle of the day when I, when I went to get a pen. So um, Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina, was a guest speaker over lunch. So I only bring this up because 5777 reminded me that Lindsey Graham says, I just want to wish you all a happy 5777. Okay, so I don't do his accent justice, but very thick, very thick Southern accent, quite the character, quite there was an off the record conversation and the language coming from Lindsey Graham was really very fascinating, fascinating indeed. Uh, quite the character, very pro-Israel, but nonetheless, he knew that this year was 5777. That's the only reason I brought that up. I don't want to go, go off on any more tangents about that. Um, but of course, that all uh, made me lose my train of thought. So uh, yes, the history. Uh, it, right. So the rabbinic history, they are the ones that determine where we are in the calendar, how far back the world was created. Of course, uh, scientists know that the world is older than 5,777 years. Okay? Now, ultra-Orthodox, very ultra-Orthodox in the Jewish community, do think that the world is 5,777 years old and will not teach evolution in ultra-Orthodox yeshivas and will not teach about dinosaurs or anything like that oh, really? because that goes against the so-called, what they would do, the so-called science of uh, dating fossils to more than 5,777 years ago totally calls into question the Jewish right and true history of the world. Okay? So... Uh, now, how do we reconcile 5777 with science which says that Earth is billions of years old? That's another question, and that uh, you could, if you're a very traditional Jew, you could answer it by saying God is reflecting the history of mankind. So you could argue the history of civilization can be dated back to when writing began, okay? Cavemen roamed the earth before 5,000 years ago. 
Neanderthals roamed the earth long before that too, but when did written communication begin? And many argue that it's around 5,000, 6,000 years ago. And if that's the case, okay, you can see that the history of the world then, based on human understanding and putting things together and having communication with God, could happen 57, 70 years, uh, 5,777 years ago. Okay. Anyway, so that's, that's a whole different question of reconciling science with religion, how much we need to do that, and how much it's challenging to our religious sensibilities. That's a whole other conversation for another time. So, um, to, to, so the, 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 to preparing for the high holidays, then, need, we need to incorporate what the high holidays are about and the history of the high holidays. And so if we are connecting to this sense of starting from scratch, there is also a sense then that we are responding to what's going on in the world around us and in our own lives today. So every, that's why I, I began by saying that every year there are different feelings that we have. So that if we, if we, if we talk globally about how we're, how we're entering this high holiday season, there's a lot of scary things going on in the world and anxiety producing things that are going on in the world around us. What with uh, the rise of ISIS and increased and continual terrorist activities around the world, where the world is a continuing dangerous place to live, the sense of who is going to be the next president of the United States and what that president will bring to America and the sense of trust that we have in either candidate, and that is totally bipartisan. Take that in a positive or negative way as much as you want. It's, it's, it is, that is anxiety producing. And then there's also with uh, the increased focus on bigotry and racism in America, so the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement in response to black unarmed people being shot but mostly by white police officers across America and what that says about the nature of uh, of community in America, how much trust or lack of trust we have of the other in America today, and what we can do about that. So, and then if we're into sports too, what Colin Kaepernick of the San Francisco 49ers and his sitting down during the national anthem, and that what response that is bringing uh, in America as well. So, lots of global and American ideas that we are dealing with all the time. We can't escape it. Whether we have these discussions at home with our families or not, it's in the newspaper, if we still read a newspaper, it's online, it's on the computer, it's on Facebook, it's whatever social media we're on every day, all the time. So we're inundated with all of these things. And then, of course, it's whatever is going on in our own personal lives. And every year, every year, that is different. So we're, we always worry about our children, our parents, our spouses, our partners, our extended family. We're always concerned about our health. And, um, and then even more so, not, maybe we don't think about this question too often, but the rabbis certainly want us to, what is the meaning of life? So, you know, we don't think of the meaning of life when we go to a wedding because we're having a great time and isn't this wonderful and the future looks bright for this couple and, well, let's all celebrate and have blessings forever but we don't attend weddings all the time. We certainly think about the meaning of life at the other end when we attend funerals and when we are experiencing the death of loved ones and friends. And the older we get, the more 
common it is for us to attend funerals. So uh, all of these things are things we think about. So some days we think about them more than others. So the, the, the rabbis have us think about this. Now, you know, it's interesting. Other holidays that we have in the calendar talk have focus on different issues. And we only focus on those issues for the length of that holiday itself. So Passover, the focus is on freedom and God's role in the redemption of our people from, from Egypt. So for seven days or eight days outside of Israel, we focus on, on freedom. So Shavuot, we think about uh, the revelation of, of God at Mount Sinai. So we have one or two days to think about that. Um, we think about uh, Purim, and we think about, which is a biblical holiday, not a Torah holiday, but we think about um, God saving us uh, at the last second from uh, tyranny and, and what we can do to protest against tyranny. That's one day to, to think about that. Here we have, if we're Sephardim, even if we're Ashkenazim, we, we just say the psalm, twice a day and blow the shofar once a day, we have 40 days. And saying the psalm, the psalm continues for another five, and five is 10, 50 days. 50 days of reciting the psalm of repentance, the psalm 27. And technically then, 50 days, because Hoshana Rabbah is really the last chance that we can ask God for forgiveness. We beat the willow branches. The, we take the willow branches out of the lulav and we add more and fresher willow branches and we recite a few PU team and we knock these willow branches against the, the, against the furniture in the chapel and as the leaves fall off, that's our last chance to ask God for forgiveness. So we have 50 days to focus on these themes as opposed to at most eight days to focus on other religious themes highlighting the sense of how important it is for the rabbis that we focus on these ideas and how central these ideas are to our life to make us have a meaningful, fulfilling life. So life always gets down to, uh, and how successful we are in life, gets down to these issues that we're confronted with every day. What, how, what's happening in the world around us, uh, how we navigate the world uh, in, in the face of this chaos that, uh, that is the world today, uh, the chaos of the greater world around us, and perhaps the chaos of our own family and what's happening in our own personal lives. How we navigate all that, we have the, the high holiday season to help uh, prepare us for that. Um, so, I'm looking at the time. It's... Uh, I'm thinking that I might not have enough time to go on to the prayers that would then um, help us focus on this. So I'm thinking that maybe the next class, which is two weeks from now, will um, will focus on the prayers related to uh, from the high holiday services, which we relate to these themes, which help us prepare for the prepare for the season. So any, any other thoughts or, or comments? All right. So I apologize to those who attempted to be online. And um, hopefully um, the recording I'll be able to post to YouTube. And then um, maybe in two weeks I'll have the, the broadcasting figured out.